denk dat je niet zo vreselijk veel macht hebt om dingen anders te laten gaan. Dat gebeurt gewoon. Maar ja, ik ben wel blij dat ik uh, gewoon nog leef natuurlijk. Ik wil het aimer. Compleetement. Distordu. Il est là, il est plus là, mais en même temps il est là. Quand tu as le spalle un dolore, una sofferenza del genere, apprezzi anche le piccole cose. Eh, non è scontato niente, non è scontato che respiri, non è scontato che stai in piedi e cammini, puoi correre. Eh, non è scontato vedere il sole, non è scontato niente. Bijna verdwaasd rond in een trans rond. Um, maar ik moet zeggen, de zorg eromheen is wel heel erg goed en ja, het was een heftige tijd, maar wel een mooie tijd. Welke gevoelens ik heb ervaren. Ja, je bent ontzettend nauw betrokken bij, uh, bij mijn vrouw, wat die meemaakt. En je, je, kunt daar, je kunt daar niks mee, maar je moet er uh, zelf mee uit de voeten en je hebt wel het volle vertrouwen, dat had ik wel steeds. Sono un medico di terapia intensiva, non un rianimatore, nel senso che lavoro con i neonati, quindi mi occupo di tutt'altra, di, di, di bambini molto molto piccoli, non, non, non faccio il loro stesso lavoro, però chiaramente il rapporto con i medici è stato condizionato anche dalla, dalla mia posizione, tra l'altro sono dei colleghi perché sono nel mio stesso. Quindi da una parte avevo, ero sicuramente facilitata nel comprendere razionalmente quello che stava succedendo, cioè non avevo bisogno dei lunghissimi colloqui perché mi spiegassero um, per avere notizie cliniche, perché um, era più semplice riassumermi le cose. D'altra parte, dal punto di vista umano, dal punto di, vis dal punto di vista della... Um, Uh, dal punto di vista emotivo questo non è servito a niente, anzi forse ha peggiorato le cose perché uh, sapevo cosa poteva succedere e non volevo accettarlo. Ora lo che mi motiva è eh, migliorare la vita della gente. Già non è tanto la tecnica no? come quando eri giovane, perché arriva un punto che la tecnica è tecnica e non ha nessun segreto, sino le piccole cose che possono fare che marcano la differenza. El hablar con el paciente, con la familia, el hacer una educación sanitaria que nadie ha hecho hasta ese punto y tú no lo sabías porque dabas por hecho que lo habían hecho. Esas cosas son las que te motivan, el mejorar el cuidado del paciente. Il el... faut faire du cas par cas en fait. C'est primordial parce que chaque histoire est différente. Et quand vous vous trouvez en tant que patient, en tant que famille de patients, dans cette situation, dans un univers où vous ne parlez pas cette langue-là, cette langue faite d'acronymes et de termes techniques que vous ne connaissez pas. Quand vous vous retrouvez face au savoir et que du coup vous vous retrouvez impuissant, que vous vous retrouvez stupide, que vous vous retrouvez humilié, que vous vous retrouvez démuni, comment faire Jokainen lääkäri varmaan pelkää komplikaatiota tai jotakin, että mitään niin ei, niin kuin, ei hiffaa jotain juttua, mitä, mitä olisi pitänyt hiffata, joskin siinäkin auttaa se, että arvoin tekee yksin, yksin koko päivä töitä. Nämä nyt, nämä tuli nyt äkkiseltä mulle mieleen. And what scares me is that making those decisions and making those wrong decisions and the realization that that decision uh, of that decision in three, four weeks' time, where you end up having a patient who, in effect, can be crippled by life-sustaining therapy, um, which may not have been in their best interests or the family's best interests. And that still scares me. And I think it scares a lot of colleagues, but um, intensive care is much more multidisciplinary now, and I think that has helped our decision-making um, and has reduced that um, fear factor. Honesty and... Humility go a long way. <laughs>
And most patients and relatives understand that we're also human and mistakes can happen uh, and should be openly discussed. Οι ασθενείς όμως μένουν, έρχονται σε επαφή με μας ιδιαίτερα αυτοί που βγαίνουν από το νοσοκομείο, πηγαίνουν σε κέντρα αποκατάστασης και ύστερα από πάρα πολύ καιρό έρχονται να μας συναντήσουν γιατί ξέρουν τα πρόσωπά, τα πρόσωπά μας, τις φωνές μας, τον αγώνα που δίνουμε μέσα στο χώρο για να καταφέρουμε ε, να τους σώσουμε, να επιβιώσουν και έρχονται να μας δουν, να μας γνωρίσουν από κοντά, να τους δούμε κι εμείς. Together with my colleagues, in particular the nursing colleagues, we arranged a wedding for a patient who was at the end of his life and had decided to marry his long-term partner before he later died. And it was very moving to be part of this very special event in the intensive care unit. It's a real privilege to be able to support a patient and their family through that um, what I hope is the worst thing that ever happens to them in their lives, to, to be able to support them through that, hopefully to recovery, or to support them um, through uh, managing a dignified death. Il faut, il faut, faut ramener la vie. Pourquoi est-ce que tout est si blanc et voire gris? Pourquoi est-ce que ce lino couine autant sous les crocs des médecins? C'est insoutenable. Pourquoi est-ce que, pourquoi est-ce que tout est autant aseptisé? C'est pas trois photos qui vont empêcher les gens de travailler. Moi, je pense que c'est important de ramener, de ramener de la vie à cet endroit où, où on se trouve à la frontière de au bord de, on se trouve dans une espèce de no man's land où on sait pas on sait pas sur quoi ça va déboucher quoi. La mia opinione della vita intensiva è fantastica perché mi hanno salvato la vita et dopo tre anni sono qui anche a un altro ospedale che mi hanno dato per morto. Per fortuna sono arrivato a questa terapia intensiva e mi hanno salvato veramente la vita. Solo belle cose possono uscire dalla mia bocca, ovviamente, perché senza di loro non saprei non sarei qui, ripeto, non sarei qui oggi. Intensive care medicine allows me to learn something new every day. So every day I meet colleagues and I hear of their new technologies, new advances and progress in their particular specialty. But most importantly, every day is a different day with new challenges. And I enjoy the interaction with my colleagues and most importantly with patients and their relatives. So it is a, provides a great variety. It's different every day. And it's a specialty where progress is made on a, on a regular basis. Grazie perché mi hanno ricordato anche come si lavora. Cioè, io faccio questo mestiere, lo faccio da tanti anni, ci sono dei momenti in cui sei stanco, in cui hai, hai, hai le tue cose, nel senso che hai la tua vita, hai delle preoccupazioni, però io ero serena quando andavo via, non perché sapevo che non sarebbe morto, poteva morire, poteva star male, ma era nelle mani migliori. Sapevo che era nelle, nelle migliori mani e, e questo mi dava, mi dava quel minimo di tranquillità che potevo cercare. È giusto che uh, i bambini che mi vengono affidati e i genitori quando vanno a casa possano pensare la stessa cosa. Siamo nelle migliori mani, quindi dobbiamo sempre fare il meglio. Grazie a loro per esserlo il meglio.
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Olfa Amzavi. I'm intensive assistant in intensive care Antoine Beclair Hospital from Paris Saclay University Hospitals and a member of the cardiovascular session in ESICM. I'm very pleased to chair this webinar from uh, the ESICM supported by GE Healthcare around fluid responsiveness. And as you know, in critically ill patients, the decisions to give fluids is a big issue at the bedside for all the physicians who try every day to find the good balance between, in one hand, not inducing fluid overload, and the other hand, not missing hypoperfusion due to a real need of fluids. The decision to give or not fluids should not be taken lightly, and I'm sure that after this webinar, you will have the right keys for this daily deal. In this webinar, we will have the opportunity with our international experts to discuss, firstly, how to differentiate between the need of fluids and fluid responsiveness, and secondly, the appropriate use of non-invasive method to assess fluid responsiveness. So you can send your questions directly on the ESICM TV or via ESIG Facebook and YouTube account, and we will have time uh, to answer them after the two talks of our experts. So first, I have the great pleasure and a big honor to introduce one among the most recognized experts in this field, Professor Xavier Monet. Professor Xavier Monet is Professor of Intensive Care in the Medical Intensive Care of Bisset Hospital from Paris Saclay University Hospitals in France. He is also the chair of the cardiovascular session of the ESICM. And we will talk about, he will talk about the need of fluids versus fluid responsiveness. So please, Xavier. Thank you very much, Alpha, for your very nice uh, and kind uh, introduction. And before starting, I disclose my collaboration with Function Medical Systems Göttinger and with um, Baxter. You're right, it's not a light question, but what are we speaking about exactly? Let's think about a patient, for instance, with septic shock on community acquired pneumonia on day one. In this patient, the PF ratio is low, the blood pressure is low, the PEEP is elevated and the patient has already received one liter and a half saline and is under norepinephrine. Blood pressure is still low. Should we give fluid to this patient or not? This is, you will agree, the daily question. The first issue we have with this treatment is that all the patients do not respond to fluid administration through the expected increase in cardiac output. Initially, this was totally ignored, but when colleagues started to measure cardiac output at the time with the pulmonary artery catheter in the 80s, they observed that some patients had no increase in stroke volume. This is the first study, I think, showing that after fluid administration. And after this first study of uh, Calvin and co-workers, many of them and many since this first study reviewed here 20 years ago, many studies confirmed that half of the patients only respond to fluid administration through a significant increase in cardiac output, and likely you know that. And the main reason is basically physiology. As if we give fluid administration, actually, we expect that stroke volume and cardiac output increase. In this way, we use the cardiac output relationship, the Frank Stalling curve at the bedside. But basically, you know, from your first um, years in a, at medical school, that the slope of the Frank Stalling curve basically depends on the ventricular function. And this explains why the same fluid administration with the same volume of fluid may lead to a significant or a negligible increase in cardiac output. It means that fluids is, are not fluid responsiveness. These are totally different concepts. It's not because you give fluid that your patient will respond to fluid. <clears throat> 
Is that really an important issue? For years, it was not that sure, but today we know all the drawbacks, all the adverse effects of fluid administration in our ICU patients and likely in the operating room patients as well. The effects of fluid are not constant and even more when you give fluid and that it does not increase cardiac output, it has only adverse effects. Mainly it increases lung water, it increases lung edema, it promotes intra-abdominal hypertension, it induces hemodilution, it promotes also right ventricular failure, etc. And more than theory, we know that this has been clearly demonstrated today, just to show you one study, the first that's been clearly showing that in septic patients, the uh, sub-analysis of the SOAP study, definitely the total amount of fluid administered, the cumulative fluid balance, is an independent predator of mortality in these patients. The more fluid you give to these patients, the more they die. And so we are left with these two issues in constant effect and potential harmfulness, which means, by the way, and confirms, by the way, that fluids are drug. We should logically predict fluid responsiveness before giving fluids. Just as antibiotics, fluids are drugs with several adverse effects and an inconstant efficacy. If you try to predict before giving antibiotics whether they will be effective or not on the germ you want to treat, the same. You should test fluid responsiveness before giving fluid to your patient. In fact, in our mind, we are drawing this very simple um, algorithm. Is cardiac output too low? Urine output is low. Lactate is elevated. Should I give fluid? There are two cases. In the minority of cases, you know that the patient will be fluid responsive because fluid losses are obvious because it's the very early phase of septic shock with obvious relative hypovolemia. In this, in this case, definitely you should not try to predict fluid responsiveness because it is very likely in these cases you should give fluid and that's all. But in the majority of cases, in all the other cases, you know that only half of the patients will respond positively to fluid administration. It means you should look at indices that will tell you before starting fluid infusion that the patient will very likely be fluid responsive. And as you know, for this purpose, static markers of cardiac preload as central venous pressure, for instance, are not valuable at all, and we should look for dynamic indices. What are we speaking about? This concept of dynamic prediction of fluid responsiveness is in fact very, very easy. It's a way to assess the slope of the cardiac function curve at the bedside. I mean, you change preload, or you observe spontaneous changes in preload, for instance, fluid administration, effects of ventilation, etc., and you look at the changes in cardiac output, stroke volume, or surrogates. If the change is significant, then you can give fluid, being sure that the patient will respond to fluid positively, otherwise, or otherwise you refrain from fluid administration. And during the last, um, during the last 20 years, um, several indices uh, were developed to predict fluid responsiveness in a dynamic way. And I suggest that together in the next minutes, we review all these uh, indices um, methods and that we together consider their um, advantages and drawbacks. Definitely the most, the easiest way to assess fluid responsiveness is just to give fluid and look at the response. It means a fluid challenge. Give three or 500 milliliters to your patient and see how he or she responds. It's very easy to do. Two main drawbacks. The first one is that bear in mind that to correctly assess the response of fluid 
to during a fluid challenge, you must measure cardiac output. If you look just at pulse pressure, arterial pressure, it is not reliable enough. You need to directly measure cardiac output. But even more importantly, inherently fluid challenges that perhaps many of you like a lot induces fluid overload. This is inherent to the method you use. Why? Because it is not a challenge, it's the treatment itself. I mean that you give fluid to a patient, and if the patient does not respond, you go on with the next bolus, etc., until the last bolus that does not increase cardiac output and stroke volume anymore, and then you stop fluid administration. This is basically the fluid channel. Let's imagine a patient as the one we, we spoke about in the beginning. Septic shock with ARDS on first day, you will agree with me, your patient will experience perhaps five, six episodes of hypertension, which means that obviously this induces fluid overload. You cannot remove the fluids you've given to your patient, and definitely the fluid challenge is not a challenge, it's the treatment itself. This is why the concept of giving small amounts of fluid 100, 150 milliliters, a mini fluid challenge might be interesting. And we now have some positive studies. My point regarding mini fluid challenge is that it requires a precise measurement of cardiac output. What do I mean? This is the first study of some French colleagues showing the interest of this, of this uh, mini fluid challenge. One milliliter of first starch and this patient's could discriminate responders from non-responders. Nevertheless, small amounts of fluid can only induce small changes in cardiac preload that can only induce small changes in cardiac output. And in this study, these small changes were detected by echocardiography. We will speak about that likely later with uh, Dr. Sanfilippo, but is cardiac echo reliable enough, precise enough to detect so small changes in cardiac output? Likely not. I'm even sure that it's not the case. Because the smallest change that you may trust with a co-cardiography in the velocity time integral in this estimation of stroke volume is 10% only. Smaller changes, you're not sure that it will, uh, that it will be detectable with accuracy. That's why. For this mini fluid challenge, I would much better rely on some more precise techniques for measuring cardiac output, cardiac index, as for instance, pulse contour analysis or other continuous methods. And for instance, in this study by the team of Mathieu Vier in Bordeaux, they showed that pulse contour analysis detected the mini fluid challenge effects. Look at the change in stroke volume less than 10%. 6%, which is compatible with the precision of pulse control analysis, not of echocardiography. Anyway, it still requires to give fluid to the patient that you cannot remove. As all of you know, pulse pressure, stroke volume variations that have been developed 20 years ago are very reliable indices of fluid responsiveness. But on the other side, we can use them in a minority of patients. And the main circumstances, situations where we cannot use these indices because they are not valuable anymore are cardiac arrhythmias, spontaneous breathing, even in, a, in an intubated patient, spontaneous uh, um, uh, ventilation, and ARDS because of lung compliance, low lung compliance, and low tidal volume. And the problem is that it's likely uh, there were a large proportion of our ICU patients where we cannot use PPV and SVP. Nevertheless, we can say that there might be a solution in the specific case of ARDS with the low tidal volume, which is that tidal volume challenge that's been developed uh, four years ago by uh, Dr. Mayatra and some other Indian colleagues. And the principle is very simple. No need to measure cardiac output. You just increase the tidal volume from, for instance, six to eight milliliters uh, per kilogram, and look at the induced changes in 
pulse pressure variation. And if PPV, PPV, I'm sorry, if pulse pressure variation increases by more than a given threshold, it's very likely your patient is fluid responsive. In this first study, we showed that the threshold was a 3.5% increase in PPV. Nevertheless, some other studies found smaller, smaller thresholds as the one we just published in, in critical care where we show that the threshold was a 1% increase only. So I think that further studies um, should uh, try to refine the threshold of the tidal volume change. The changes in the diameter of inferior IVC, superior SVC, vena cave are very popular indices. I think that many colleagues like it a lot. Actually, you don't need to measure cardiac output or, or, or VTI or stroke volume. Just look at the changes in the diameter of the vena cap. First drawback, you must know how to do that. Nevertheless, it's very easy to assess it. At least the IVC, SVC is much more complicated. You need TEE, it's not easy. But IVC, definitely, it is, uh, it is very easy. My point here is that keep in mind that these are the less reliable indices of fluid responsiveness we have. It's today very clear. Many small size studies showed that, and many meta analyses of this study confirmed that. Even more, we have a, a, two, um, a, a, a 20,000. Um, a 17 large French negative study. Look, in that study, the ability of the changes in the IVC to predict, to detect preload responsiveness was very low. The area under the rack curve was only 0.65, which is very low. So it is well demonstrated and likely it can be explained why. Why does, for instance, the IVC change with ventilation in fluid responsive or preload responsive patients? Did you think about that already? It's not only due to the slope of the Frank Starling curve. I mean that if it changes, it's likely because, yes, the intramural pressure, the CVP, changes in case of preload responsiveness. But the change also depends on other factors the compliance of the IVC, the intra-abdominal pressure, and so the transmission, the degree of transmission between the thoracic and the abdominal pressure, it's not only related to preload responsiveness. And I think it is the reason why it has a so low predictive ability. In addition, these changes in vena cava diameter share most of the limitations of PPV and SVV do not use it in patients with low tidal volume and spontaneous breathing. And expiratory occlusion test path use, perhaps you've heard about that, about that test that we developed uh, years ago with uh, Jean-Louis Teboul in this study. The principle is very easy. It's all about heart lung interruptions. Indeed, in a patient with mechanical ventilation, you agree that each uh, insufflation tends to um, impede venous return. It decreases cardiac preload, and then the next cycle uh, stops, the cycle stops, preload increases, next insufflation, preload decreases, etc., etc. And so the principle of the test is that if, if you stop mechanical ventilation for a few seconds, for instance, 15 seconds, you increase cardiac preload for a few seconds. And if in turn, stroke volume increases, it means that both ventricles are preload dependent. The duration must be at least 15 seconds or 12 seconds because the, 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 the prelude ballast must cross the pulmonary circulation, and also the cardiac output monitors we use must average this change in cardiac output. And uh, today, we have several studies showing that there is a good 
level of reliability, which performed this beta analysis a few uh, a month ago with uh, Francesco Gavelli, you see the threshold is a 5% increase. And look at the area under the rock curve, all 0.95 compared to IBC changes. It's totally different. It's very easy if you have a direct display of cardiac output under your eyes, for instance, with pulse control analysis again, or any, any other technique. With echocardiography, it is possible, but since the threshold is, is low, and because of the precision of echocardiography, we showed in this study that you need to add to the end expiratory occlusion and, and inspiratory occlusion that will, that will enlarge the induced changes with a higher threshold, but that will make the changes in cardiac output induced by the test detectable by echocardiography. Of course, it's not possible to use it in patients with a strong respiratory efforts. They, they interrupt the, the occlusion. And again, it, you need something that measures cardiac output. It's difficult to measure with a blood pressure only. Let's end up with the passive leg raising test that likely you know. Many studies have shown that it is a reversible preload challenge. On average, the volume is 300 milliliters of blood, but it's very variable from one patient to another. But it's a, a pseudo-fluid channel. I would like to insist on two points, two last points regarding the passive leg raising test. The first is that you need something that measures cardiac output to perform the test. Unfortunately, if you use arterial pressure, and especially onto your pulse pressure, it's not very reliable. Then you need something that measures cardiac output. And many studies have looked at um, reliable ways to perform the test in a non-invasive way, because of course you can use uh, pulse control analysis, but of course all, all the patients are not equipped with such uh, systems. A soft gel dapper, not easy in the ICU. Echocardiography, you look for an increase in the VTI by more than 10%. Capnography, I don't have time to show that, but it's interesting. Bioreactants is likely is reliable. Changes in carotid flow, I think it is not reliable, but again, no time to insist on that, because I'd like to speak about platysmography. SpO2 to assess the effects of passive leg raising. This PLAT signal that we have under our eyes every day, in fact, is made of two parts. There is a pulsatile systolic part of the signal and a non-pulsatile portion that you don't see on your screen. And the ratio between both is called the PR, the perfusion index. And you can easily understand that it has two determinants. The first one is vasomotor tone. Of course, if the patient is vasoconstricted, the PI is low. But also stroke volume, because it will increase the pulsatility of SpO2. So is it possible to use that amplitude of SpO2 to assess the effects of, for instance, passive leg raising or a fluid challenge? I don't show all the details of this study that we performed, but Look, the changes in this PI were able to detect, to detect, I'm sorry, the changes in cardiac output induced by passive leg raising and volume expansion. And if, for instance, in this fluid non-responder here, there was no change, neither in cardiac index nor in perfusion index. So SpO2 to detect changes in cardiac output during passive leg raising be careful, we had to exclude some patients because the signal was very unstable. We showed recently that the PI can also detect the change, detect, I'm sorry, the changes in the end expiratory occlusion test. We need some confirmation, but likely a way which is costless, non-invasive, and widely available to assess changes in cardiac output in, in these uh, tests. Finally, you may, you may use just PPV, which is displayed on your screens, for instance, during passive leg raising, as we showed recently. Finally, less reliable in case of intra-abdominal hypertension. Likely, there was less volume in the abdomen, less possibility to 
um, less volume to mobilize during the test. It's been suspected for years that um, it may induce some false negatives, and we confirmed it in this uh, study published two years ago. In patients with intra-abdominal hypertension, fluid increase, volume expansion, increase cardiac index, passive leg raising to a lesser extent, meaning that there might be some, not all, but some false negatives in these cases. So I think the best dynamic ways to assess fluid responsiveness might be the mini fluid challenge, the end expiratory occlusion test, and passive leg raising. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Xavier, uh, for your, as usual, your uh, brilliant presentation. And I'm sure that we will have uh, a lot of questions after and we'll try to have some time for the question. And now let us move to the second speaker, who is one of among our brilliant experts in echocardiography, and he's a uh, part of the ASIC group for advanced eco accreditation, the EDEC program. Dr. Filippo Sanfilippo is a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care at the Polyclinico University Hospital in Catania. And he will be talking about non-invasive assessment of fluid responsiveness. So please, Filippo. Thank you very much, uh, Otto, for the uh, introduction. Thank you for the invitation. It's uh, such a privilege. Uh, I hope this is uh, running the presentation. Uh, so, sorry, we have some... need to share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's uh, That's okay. sharing now. And uh, what I put this. Okay, is that okay now? Yeah, it's okay. Sorry. Okay, thank you very much again for the invitation and the presentation. It's an honor and privilege. I have no conflict of interest. And, uh, in the agenda, what I did put is a couple of thoughts of what is non-invasive in the, in the intensive care. And then, uh, of course, uh, we talk about echocardiography, point of care, and ultrasound, and a few other considerations on non-invasive assessment for fluid responsiveness. Uh, when I was given the title, the first thought was, uh, OK, I'm going to uh, speak about uh, ultrasound for sure. but. Uh, uh, before that, uh, I thought, what is truly non-invasive in the intensive care? And uh, uh, certainly, most of our patients are, uh, have got an arterial line cut in situ. So in this case, uh, uh, monitoring uh, advanced cardiac output uh, with force of control method analysis or other uh, approaches, it doesn't mean adding any invasive or risk to, our, to the patient. So, uh, echo is not mutually exclusive with this other monitoring tool. And uh, before moving to the uh, approaches to uh, define fluid responsiveness with non-invasive uh, methods, I would like to uh, remind about the definition study led by our president, Maurizio Cecconi, which showed that uh, most of the fluid challenges were given without a variable user. And uh, um, when a variable was used, People use mainly uh, static variables, while dynamic variables were used only in 22% of the all fluid channels. And if we look in green uh, at the bottom of the screen, the echo variables, these were used very rarely. Um, echocardiography and point of care ultrasound variable are based mainly on dynamic evaluation and uh, rather than on static measurement. And uh, uh, during this presentation, we try to cover uh, assessment of uh, fluid responsiveness using the heart, the veins, and the arteries. Uh, so uh, from uh, the heart perspective, uh, as mentioned already by uh, Professor Monet, we evaluate the variation of uh, stroke volume and cardiac output and how these uh, changes over time with either preload redistributing maneuvers as passive leg raising or with ventilation induced changes. Um, the calculation of stroke volume and cardiac output, uh, uh, I'm sure most of the people are aware, is performed with echocardiography, calculating the diameter of the LBOT and then uh, to get the pulse wave doctor uh, analysis of the flow in the LBOT with an apical five chamber view. Um, Professor Monet has already uh, discussed the limitation of uh, echocardiography measurement in cardiac output with uh, 
uh, inter and intra observer variability, of course. And in this regard, uh, some help may be given, but needs a research and study. But this new software that allows automated tracing of the BTI, as you can see in this example, where the LVOT diameter was 2.2 centimeter, and the machine already calculated the uh, BTI and gave us number of stock volume and target up. Uh, of course, uh, it can be uh, calculated also with chances of ideal echocardiography. Uh, the principle behind are the same, just the views are uh, different. Um, I move uh, now to uh, the bigger part of the presentation, which is the use of the venous district to assess fluid responsiveness. And certainly the interior vena cava is the most studied parameter. Uh, where, uh, in order to understand the fluid responsiveness, we evaluate uh, changes in the diameter of the vena cava, and uh, uh, this is performed according to the change in the uh, pressure into the chest during either spontaneous or invasive mechanical ventilation. Uh, now, the pioneer uh, were our uh, French uh, friends, and uh, in particular, in 2004, we have two uh, important papers by the group of Professor Jean-Louis Taboul and the group of Professor Antoine de la Baron, where uh, the authors found a different cutoff uh, for fluid responsiveness, but uh, please note how they use the different formula. While the group of Prof. Uh, Taboul did divide the, the, the variation of the IBC diameter over the IC, IBC mean diameter and found a 12% cutoff to predict fluid responsiveness, the group of Professor Antoine Villabaron divided the variation of the IBC by the uh, IBC minimum diameter, and that they found that 18% cutoff. Uh, the last formula is probably the one that is uh, more commonly used and is called the IBC distensibility index. And this is important from dictionary perspective. Uh, because uh, the term refers to the increase in size during the inspiration. Uh, we have also studies that were performed later on by other groups and uh, in the patient with spontaneous ventilation. In this case, uh, all the groups have used the IBC collapsibility index, where the variation of the IBC diameter is uh, divided by the IBC maximum diameter. And the authors of these studies uh, found that uh, good cutoff for fluid responsiveness are around 40 to 48%. However, as already mentioned by Prof. Monet, uh, the group of Professor Philippe Vignon from France performed a much bigger study than the other one, where they found lower sensitivity and specificity. And in this regard, then, I, I think it's fair to show you uh, the pool of the results from meta-analysis and what we can take from the IBC. So there are several meta-analyses, and one of these in 2017 started to introduce the concept that uh, fluid responsiveness uh, using the IBC variation can be better uh, predicted if we use it in mechanically ventilated patients, as you can see where uh, the area under the curve decreases slightly in the patient not ventilated. But what I find very uh, interesting is these uh, other meta-analysis in that published in anesthesia and anesthesia in November 18 by the group of shang -Xi, where the authors identified the 12 big studies uh, in uh, evaluating the uh, IBC variation for fluid responsiveness. And they identified that uh, ventilator settings were a source of significant heterogeneity. And uh, therefore, the authors decided to divide studies according to the way patients were ventilated. Therefore, we have six studies where patients were ventilated with at least 8 ml per kg of tidal volume and with a peak of 5 centimeter of water or below, while the other six studies were performed in patients with lower tidal volume and or higher peak level. What the authors found, that uh, the area under the curve was uh, much bigger and reliable when the patients were ventilated with bigger tidal volume and lower peak, rather than when patients were ventilated with low tidal volume and higher 
So this is a take home message. Uh, recently, uh, it's in 2021, the group of uh, uh, Alvarado Sanchez published a meta analysis looking at predictors of fluid responsiveness in patient ventilation at low tidal volume. And if we look at the results of the IDC, we can see that the area under the curve is 0 0.86, which is a bit lower than others, uh, but uh, not so lower. Uh, as mentioned by Prof. Uh, Monet, there are a lot of situations where the IDC cannot be reliable, and this is a nice review by Gabriele Via, and uh, uh, among others, uh, I would like to uh, mention the RV failure, tricuspid regurgitation, cardiac tamponade, and uh, as mentioned by Prof. Monet, also intra-abdominal hypertension. There are several reasons when and conditions and scenario where the IDC is not reliable. Uh, I would like to uh, continue a bit on the IDC with a couple of uh, uh, news. Uh, first of all, the use of artificial intelligence, which seems promising in this study. The um, uh, algorithm of artificial intelligence was a good argument with the point of care with sound expert for evaluating the IDC collapsibility. And the use of, uh, as you can see in these images, of software for automatic border detection of the IDC can be uh, helpful also in decreasing the time of uh, data collection at the bed space and allowing rep uh, repeated measurement. The other concept uh, that uh, I would like to introduce on the IDC is uh, uh, the possibility to use another uh, window to uh, look at the IDC, as you can see here. Uh, it can be uh, imaged through the liver, basically using the transhepatic view. The first study was conducted by our Indian colleagues, and the authors found that uh, while the diameters were not uh, reliable comparing the uh, standard and the transhepatic view, the limits of argument were acceptable when they looked at the percentage variation. So this could be an option when you have a patient with chest drain, like in this study by the group of Massimiliano Maineri, where they uh, performed the, the same uh, concept study in the um, post-operative period of cardiac surgery, but also when we have a patient with laparotomy or with difficult uh, views for uh, looking at the IDC from the subcostal approach. Uh, so again, of course, the uh, automated border detection can be helpful. And uh, this is an example where collapsibility index was 26% in the subcostal and 23% in the transhepatic uh, B. Let's move now to the superior vena cava, where, uh, of course, as mentioned by Prof. Monet, is uh, performed in mechanically ventilated patients. It requires much more skill than the use of transesophageal echocardiography, which is not everywhere available. Uh, the pioneer group in this regard is the group of Professor Antoine Villarbaron where uh, they calculated the SVC collapsibility index because of the collapse of the SVC during inspiration. And the authors found that the 36% cutoff predicted with 100% accuracy uh, the uh, patient with an increase in cardiac index after volume expansion with a 90% specificity in patients that uh, didn't respond to volume expansion. Um, how does the superior vena cava perform as compared to the IDC? Uh, it seems to perform better according to this study where the authors found that a cutoff of 35%, which is very similar to the 36% uh, identified by the group of uh, vena uh, had much better specificity and sensitivity as compared to the uh, IDC distensibility index. Uh, another option is to use the miniaturized TE probe, which is uh, available in some units. And uh, in this study, in patients undergoing open major vascular surgery, the authors compared the SPC uh, collapsibility index with stroke volume variation. And what they found is that both indexes 
have had a good productivity around 0.9%. And again, that's a cutoff was very similar to the one used by the group of uh, Professor Villar Baron. Uh, one uh, concept that must be clear is, of course, that with the HD, there is no omni plane, and the SDC is. Uh, identified in the short axis view, while in the transits of ideal electrocardiography, we use it in the long axis. Let's move now to uh, other part of the venous district, which I call as non vena cava vein. And several districts have been evaluated for responsiveness subclavian, internal jugular, femoral, femoral, and hepatic. Uh, there are these two studies by Dr. Uh, Kent, which I uh, will uh, summarize in this table to make it uh, uh, easier. So, uh, in the first study, they, the authors evaluated the IBC as compared to the subclavian vein with 94 paired measurement. And in the second one, they evaluated the internal jugular vein or the femoral vein as compared to the IBC. What the authors found is that time to data acquisition is shorter for the three uh, other districts as compared to the IBC. However, the subclavian vein and the internal jugular vein had an overestimation of 3.2 to 3.5%, while the femoral vein had a 3.8% underestimation. More importantly, the correlation uh, was acceptable for the subclavian vein, but it wasn't that good for uh, the IJD or the femoral vein. Uh, also, hepatic vein, and in particular the middle hepatic vein, have been uh, studied. Uh, in this regard, it's a bit more complex the analysis of uh, pulse wave Doppler, but uh, one of the most important. Uh, Parameter in this uh, pattern is the change in the diastolic, uh, diastolic uh, uh, flow. And uh, this is a study uh, from our Chinese colleague that found a very good area under the curve by the changes in the uh, D wave uh, calculated with echocardiography. So, sorry, with point of care ultrasound, of course. My summary on uh, uh, the use of non vena cava vein for fluid responsiveness is that. Uh, they are uh, interesting. They are targets that uh, most of the time are accessible and easier to perform. Uh, but people must be aware of the measurement bias, the different cutoff uh, for each uh, index, and the correlation anyway is never really strong with uh, the IBC. And more importantly, we know that there are factors interfering with the IBC and the SBC diameter and the changes, and uh, there is no reason to uh, why this shouldn't uh, affect also the flow uh, upstream. Let's move now to the uh, arteries. And uh, regarding the arteries, the ascending aorta has been used mainly in children with uh, echocardiography, but uh, the carotid artery is another interesting. Uh, um, targets that I will uh, discuss. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, common indexes that have been studied is the corrected, corrected carotid flow time, where uh, the operator evaluates the uh, time between the systolic peak to the uh, dichrotic uh, notch. And uh, as a rule of thumb, the lower the time, the most likely the patient will be fluid responder. Of course, this needs to be corrected for the uh, heart rate, and this is why we call it corrected carotid flow time. Another one is the carotid blood flow, which essentially has the same principle behind the uh, calculation of cardiac output. So we measure the diameter of the artery and the VTI with pulse rate analysis. Um, there are several studies on the uh, corrected carotid flow time, and I will show you this one from the group of Maxim Canson, where patients with undifferentiated shock had a good area under the curve when the uh, corrected carotid flow time uh, variation after passive leg raising was uh, used to identify uh, fluid responders. Uh, however, there are also studies that were not able to identify a cutoff point on the use of carotid flow time. Uh, my uh, summary on carotid flow time 
is that uh, certainly the disidentification of the artery is a uh, good point, uh, but the analysis can be challenging because it needs some angle correction because the measurement is in milliseconds and therefore it's more prone to uh, uh, measurement errors. And the identification of the decorative notch may be more challenging, especially in very tactical uh, There are conflicting findings between studies. And uh, uh, the last point is that carotid blood flow could be a better alternative, at least as shown by the group of iron map, where uh, measurement of carotid blood flow was a better marker of fluid responsiveness and uh, as compared to the carotid uh, corrected flow time. There are several other non-invasive assessment of fluid responsiveness uh, with non-ultrasound and non-arterial line methods. Uh, Prof. Monet has shown you about the saturation waveform analysis, but uh, uh, again, uh, Prof. Monet has conducted several studies also on uh, entitled CO2 variation after uh, passive leg raising uh, for fluid responsiveness. Um, before concluding my presentation, I would like to stress that uh, uh, fluid may be harmful to the patient, and therefore we need to collect as many information as possible or as feasible. And the risk to harm the patient comes not only during uh, information acquisition, so when we use invasive versus non-invasive methods, but also when we uh, collect uh, information that may be not accurate or precise, and therefore we could uh, make wrong clinical decisions. Uh, the non-invasive tool for fluid uh, responsiveness can be associated also to other non-invasive tool uh, to evaluate whether the patient needs fluid, and the center in these regards, the use of lung ultrasound or uh, the venous congestion uh, score by Philippe Rola could be really promising tool that are under investigation. Uh, in conclusion, uh, there is uh, certainly no holy grail for non-invasive assessment of fluid responsiveness. And echocardiography and point of care ultrasound are invaluable too, but not only for fluid responsiveness, for the assessment of patients in shock, and so on. Uh, there are issues on training and resources, of course, as well. And uh, clinicians should combine all the information to decide whether fluid uh, administration is appropriate. And finally, let me mention that there is no reason why in the future intensivists shouldn't be competent in uh, echocardiography and point of care ultrasound. So please do consider the European Diploma of Echocardiography uh, by our society and uh, also to join uh, our Congress, annual Congress that will start in less than one month. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Filippo San Filippo, for this nice and uh, complete presentation about the non-invasive uh, devices for uh, fluid assessing fluid responsiveness. And I have uh, we have just ten minutes for question. I have some question for the moment for Xavier, but probably we should have some other question for you. Uh, Filippo, so the first question is that can we use the PPV and SVV in the following situation? The first situation, when patient has intercostal tube, chest tube, or abdominal drains, uh, because there is probable disruption of the pressure transmission. And the second part for the situation is uh, can we use these parameters when we have long femoral access for RRT? So, re uh, thank you uh, uh, for the question. Chest tubes and uh, abdominal drainage. Abdominal drainage, it's not, I think it's not been uh, investigated. Olfa, do you know any study about it? Abdominal drainage, I don't know. Oh, Chest yeah. tubes. Likely it is less reliable because, of course, some of the pressure induced by ventilation is uh, escapes out of the lungs. Less reliable and false negatives. Regarding uh, renal replacement therapy and femoral artery, PPV and SUV keeps its reliability 
And it's not, um, I mean that, of course, it may detect hypovolemia induced by priming of the circuit, by um, ultrafiltration by the circuit, etc. But of course, the, uh, the arterial line must not be in contact just uh, with the, uh, with the, um, there must not be a, how may I say, of course, it should not be in a fistula, okay? It, of course, if no. renal replacement therapy is performed in a vein and PPV is measured in an artery. Artery. That's what Recirculation I of... Uh, okay, Xavier, the second question is uh, regarding the end expiratory occlusion test, how practicable to induce a breath hold for 12 seconds in ICU? I think you have a, a quick exactly. answer. Exactly as you do for uh, um, measuring the intrinsic peak, you know, you have a button on the ventilator, you click on it and you wait until 15 seconds. In some ventilators, by the way, it stops automatically at 15 seconds for avoiding too long uh, ventilatory uh, poses. So just by click on the button, and look at the patient. If there is no breathe, spontaneous breathe, if the patient is totally awake, for instance, then the test is valid. And at the same time, you look at the value of cardiac output or with a co-cardiography at VTI or SPO2, et cetera, et cetera. So it is just by clicking on the button. Again, the, the time is, is, um, is a bit long. I, I repeat the cross of the pulmonary circulation and the fact that you have to average several values of cardiac output, so to keep the, the max value, to catch the max value, you need to have a quite long and expert occlusion. But five seconds, definitely, it's too short, you will see nothing on cardiac output. And Xavier, as you said, also, if the patient has a lot of uh, inspiratory efforts, spontaneous inspiration, it's not possible to do that. But it's not very frequent in your practice. It's, it's not that frequent because in the ICU, many patients have a, a low level sedations or spontaneously do not breathe that much. But it's true that in some patients, it is not possible. The study we performed, we, we found that I think it was in, in 10 or 15% of common ICU patients that definitely it's not possible. So it's not a, a majority of the patients, it's a minority of them. Okay, I still with you, Xavier. And I will read integrally the, the question. Hi, Xavier. In 2016, you published a study, My Patient Received Fluids, in which you underline the side effects of fluid administration. In view of this, should we redefine the term of fluid responder, not only for cardiac output increase, but also tissue oxygenation without increasing CVP and, uh, or intra-abdominal pressure um, uh, extravascular lung water, no high modulation, no RV impairment. A new definition? Uh, I thank our friend for uh, that lung question. The, my, our point in this review is to say that it's not give. It's not just give fluid and and go away. No, you should really look at the response to fluids. Of course, you measured preload responsiveness, you assessed preload responsiveness before, but after fluid infusion, do not leave the room. Did cardiac output actually increase? Did tissue oxygenation increase and it improved? And it's not in all the patients with increasing cardiac output. Did you induce some adverse effects of fluid administration? Increase in CVP, in lung water, etc. So it is not just assessing preload responsiveness, but also the response, positive and negative response to fluid administration. Okay, thank you, Xavier. A last question for you, Xavier, and then after for, for uh, Filippo. Uh, is PPV and SVV useful in patients with heart rate more than 140 beats per minute? Uh, likely not. There has been one study, at least one I know, by the team of Daniel de Becker showing that if heart rate is, is too um, is too high, PPV has no time to vary. In fact, but of course, for this you really need a, a very uh, a rapid uh, vent. No, I am sorry. It is with rapid ventilation. So if the rate of rate of ventilation of a heart rate is is very uh, high, then you cannot use it. I think it's only for exceptional values 
actually, but it may happen. Okay. It happens for respiratory rates more than 40 breaths per minute. Regarding heart rate itself, so tachycardia, there is no reason because the, the, it works even for high heart rates, even more because ventilation, if ventilation is slow, slow enough, you will see variations, whatever the number of cardiac cycles. So tachycardia, no problem, very rapid ventilation. It might be a problem with false negatives in case of very, very rapid ventilation. Of course, and uh, when it is tachyarrhythmia, of course, it's not applicable and it's not valid. Very good point. You're right, of course, to, to mention that. So, Filippo, uh, we have some questions for you. Uh, I will read it also in Tigri because it's, um, it's a, nice, uh, a nice question. Thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. I would like to know if I can use VTI variation and the mechanical ventilation to assess fluid responsiveness. Okay, thank you for the question. Yes, I mean, uh, VTI variation are uh, calculated with the pulse wave doppler and can be used. And I would suggest to couple it with maneuvers that change the load uh, to the patient, let's say passive leg raising. Of course, also with the variation in the, uh, in the uh, ventilation, okay? Uh, so you measure the uh, biggest and the uh, smallest PPI, but as you phrase it, there is a risk of also um, errors. And as mentioned by uh, Prof. Monet, there is a high variability, inter-observer and intra-observer variability. So then when you when you measure it and uh, you have uh, uh, a big, big variation, then it will be clear that your patient is possibly fluid responder. Uh, but for smaller variation, then um, on its own it could be less active. I would suggest to couple it with the passive leg raising, with variation, uh, or with an endospiratory occlusion test and so on. Uh, the technical uh, issue is that you need to stay still with your probe and you need advanced skills from echocardiography perspective and so on. And we know also how it can be challenging to gather uh, apical five chamber view in uh, patients uh, ventilated in the, uh, in the intensive care. So also the feasibility of it uh, is uh, uh, it's, uh, an option. It's, a, it's a, an issue that can be uh, taken on board. Okay, can so... Uh, also, sorry, can I make a call yeah. very briefly on the, the first question received by Prof. Monet? Uh, agree that there are no studies on the chest tube and how they influence the uh, IBC variation or other indexes. But if the chest tube is there, not for a big pneumothorax and with a risk of uh, accumulation, the chest tube can be clamped for a few seconds during the assessment. Uh, so this is an option that uh, uh, can be considered several if it doesn't expose the patient to, uh, to uh, risk. Okay, so what about the IVC diameter usage in femoral venous excess for CRRT? What about the, oh, okay, the IVC uh, and uh, in the venous uh, uh, access to it. I mean, it's a, we are still in the pioneer uh, uh, era for the venous access uh, ultrasound, and uh, um, I would first consider if the patient is fluid responder, and then if the operator is skilled to use the access or lung ultrasound, then of course take this information on board. If you use it uh, during a CRRT, I'm not aware there are studies uh, evaluating. Uh, we, we still need studies on BEX, and then, of course, on the limitation of BEX, so let, let's say, like a uh, patient undergoing uh, CRRT. So mm, I'm not aware uh, of any study in this regard, and uh, it may influence, of course, uh, but it needs to be properly studied and addressed from a scientific perspective. To, to continue with the vexes, I have a question. What is your cutoff point of fluid therapy? Uh, I personally must admit that uh, I am uh, I don't use vexes frequently, 
uh, is still something that needs to be studied. And I think we still need the evidence before we introduce in clinical practice. We don't, we don't need to be over enthusiastic with ECOAS, with any other uh, tool. Uh, we just need to evaluate scientifically all this and see whether they can help to distinguish patients that may need or may not need to do it. I think Vexus will have a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, space uh, in the, uh, during the recovery of the patient, the critically ill patient, when we will use it uh, to understand uh, how much intravenous congestion and how much we need to push on uh, fluid removal. And there are studies uh, by Manu Malbrain and other experts implementing also CRRT during recovery of the patient uh, for uh, speeding up the fluid uh, removal. But we are still at uh, early stages. Okay, uh, Xavier, uh, we have a, a last question and then we finish. Increasing cardiac output doesn't assure increasing blood pressure. Do you think you could be satisfied with only increasing cardiac output? Uh, it depends for which test. Um, if we speak about um, fluid challenge or passive leg raising, which is like a fluid challenge, then it must increase cardiac output. Basically, fluid should increase cardiac output, and blood pressure is only a side effect, and it does not always in all the cases. So basically, that's why for this test, you need to measure cardiac output or estimate it in a way that you can, unfortunately, you cannot rely just on blood pressure. So definitely, what you must look for, fluid, test of fluid responsiveness, basically it is for an increase in cardiac output or a surrogate. Okay, thank you, Xavier. Thank you, Filippo. Uh, we thank uh, all the audience and the uh, ESICMG Healthcare for this nice webinar. And uh, I say to you just good evening, everybody. And thank you, Alpha. Uh, thank you very much for your Bye. moderation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.